Okay, cytopenia, hemoglobin was 8 and platelets were 80,000. There were no schistocytes on the smear. Um, his PTAPT was normal, his DCT was negative. Uh, because he was suspecting lupus, uh, he underwent serological workup where we did his C3 and C4. Both were found to be low. His ANA was very strongly positive, 1 in 320 dilution. His DSDNA also was strongly positive with a titer of 1,532. All his APLA antibodies were negative. Ultrasound showed normal-sized kidneys and his cultures came out to be negative. So because we had a diagnosis of RPGN in the setting of lupus, he underwent a renal biopsy. This is, uh, Josephine, can you start sharing your slides, ma? Is my screen visible, ma'am? Yes. Go ahead, Josephine. Okay. Uh, good morning, all. Uh, so with the above mentioned history, uh, we received a renal biopsy. We received a linear core of gray white soft tissue measuring 1.2 by 0.1 centimeter, which was all embedded. This is the whole mount view, and we can uh, identify around 11 glomeruli in this linear core. Uh, this is the high power view of the glomeruli, which shows the uh, characteristic capillary wall thickening, and it is referred to as wire looping, and it is caused by the subendothelial immune deposits. Uh, which are completely involving the peripheral circumference of the glomerular capillary. We can see the rigid, ectatic, uh, thickened capillary walls here. This image here shows the fibrin thrombi, which we can see inside the capillary lumen. And um, there is no glomerular wall attachment around these thrombi. Another image to show the formation of fibrin thrombi within the capillary lumen in the glomeruli. Here we can also um, identify a lot of karyorectic debris in this area. This karyorectic debris is due to glomerular necrosis, which is associated with apoptosis of infiltrating nutrients. Okay. This glomeruli here, um, here we can see uh, along with the thrombi Along with numerous small fibrin thrombi seen in the capillary lumen, here we can see uh, there is segmental mesangial matrix expansion and mesangial hypercellularity. This is very important because it is the first observable response to mesangial deposits. Uh, this is uh, an image to show the histopath image to show the tubulo interstitial involvement. Here we can see a foci of uh, interstitial inflammation, which is consisting of inflammatory cells. Here we can see focal tubular damage showing dilated tubules. Also, we can see few tubular casts. Um, this is a mason trichrome stained section. In the image on the left uh, glomeruli, we can see few subendothelial deposits which cause the characteristic wire looping. And these appear fusionophilic on uh, mason trichrome staining. Image on the right here, along with the wire looping seen in the periphery, we can also notice these fibrin thrombi which are also appearing red this is the whole mark one second Josephine, sorry uh, we uh, we use the term now hyaline thrombi instead of fibrin thrombi okay so yes, it's yes, yes. thrombi rather than the fibrin thrombi okay i'll tell you later you yes. can't oh, okay ma'am so this is the whole mount view of the mason trichrome just to show the slight increase in interstitial fibrosis we have given an increase in interstitial fibrosis by 10 percent this is a section from the pas stain slide here in the glomeruli we can see the characteristic capillary wall thickening which is highlighted by the pas stain the pas stain stains the globular basement membrane and we can see the characteristic thickening and wire looping also, in the adjacent tubules here, we can see RBC casts, which are PAS negative. These two images, again, show the characteristic glomerular uh, basement membrane thickening and the wire loop lesions, which are very well highlighted by the PAS stain. Here, along with um, the glomerular basement membrane thickening, we also notice a foci of carrier excess and endocapillary hypercellularity. We can see that the capillary lumen is obliterated and we can see a lot of carrierectic debris. 
this again this is a pa slide this is to show the interstitial inflammation and a small foci of tubulitis we move on to the if panel where uh, immune deposits stained positive for igg igm iga c1q and c3 and when it stains for these five we call it a full house effect also we can notice that um, here the there is a characteristic shape of these uh, deposits it is comma shaped with the smooth outer contour which is very characteristic of subendothelial deposits so it stains positive for almost all conjugates except fibrinogen and albumin moving on to the nih scoring system for activity and chronicity indices we noticed there was prominent endocapillary hypercellularity um, neutrophils karyorexis highland deposits fibrinoid necrosis or, but we did not identify any crescents there was mild interstitial inflammation so the activity index was graded uh, 11 by 20 out of 24 and for chronicity index we noticed there was mild tubular atrophy and interstitial fibrosis so there was a, it was a total score of 2 out of 12 so with the previous known history of sle since 2 months and uh, ana and double stranded dna being positive by immunofluorescence we gave a diagnosis of combined lupus nephritis class 4 and 5 according to the isn rps classification with an activity index of 11 out of 24 and a chronicity index of 12 out of 24 so moving on to the discussion part what is sle systemic lupus erythematosus is an autoimmune disease of unknown etiology which is characterized by inflammation of multiple organ systems and there is multiple organ system involvement like involvement of joints skin serocell membranes cns and kidney the clinical and pathological manifestations of sle associated renal disease are diverse and clinically apparent renal disease occurs in up to 50% of sle patients usually within one year of disease onset and it is a major cause of morbidity and mortality so this uh, table here shows a wide spectrum of uh, renal lesions we can see that it involves it can involve the glomerular compartment or the tubular interstitial or the vascular compartment it can also cause non lupus nephritis in which there are minimal or no immune deposits so what is lupus nephritis is when this disease involves the glomerular compartment predominantly there is immune complex mediated glomerular disease with variable tubulo interstitial and vascular lesions appearing in a clinical setting of sle now we know that the diagnosis is established prior to renal biopsy itself using clinical and lab criteria so in such a setting why do we need renal biopsy the primary reasons are one is to determine the class of lupus nephritis and next is to determine the activity and chronicity index these are very important because these two guide the choice of therapy also it helps in identifying cases of non lupus nephritis which we saw in the spectrum of uh, renal diseases now non lupus nephritis is nothing but renal disease without any immune deposits seen in a clinical setting of sle and it includes uh, lupus related conditions like lupus photocytopathy and it could include even unrelated conditions like acute allergic interstitial nephritis so this is the latest 2018 revised uh, isn rps uh, lupus nephritis classification class 1 also known as minimal mesangial lupus nephritis class 2 is uh, it was initially known as mesangial proliferative lupus nephritis now we have replaced the term proliferative with mesangial hypercellularity which refers to uh, equal to or greater than 4 mesangial nuclei in a area class 3 and class 4 are very similar they are characterized by uh, capillary wall deposits the only difference is in the quantity if it involves less than 50% of the glo sampled glomeruli it is class 3 if it in if it involves 50% or more glomeruli it is class 4 class 5 is also known as membranous lupus nephritis and class 6 is the advanced sclerotic lupus nephritis which involves more than 90% glomeruli they happen to be globally sclerotic without any residual activity so first we discuss class 1 which is defined by a normal appearance in light microscopy and immune complex deposits are only identified by immunofluorescence or electron microscopy so there are mesangial deposits immune deposits in this the clinical features are the patients present with a normal renal function and very mild or no hematuria or proteinuria however systemic manifestations of lupus are present and lupus serologies are positive lupus serologies are nothing but the elevated uh, ana double stranded dna and the low complement levels so this is the light microscopic picture of class 1 where we see a normal appearing glomeruli the glomerular basement membrane is unremarkable and there is no significant hypercellularity 
the immunofluorescence picture here shows delicate mesangial positivity and on electron microscopy we can see some small electron dense deposits in the mesangium here so that was class 1 now moving on to class 2 which was known as mesangial proliferative lupus nephritis this is characterized by a pure mesangial hypercellularity and deposits of uh, any degree and or mesangial matrix expansion seen in light microscopy similar to class 1 here also we see mesangial immune deposits by if or electron microscopy the clinical features here are uh, there are only there are no or only mild clinical renal abnormalities less than 50% of the patients may present with mild hematuria and or proteinuria which does not exceed more than 1 gram in 24 hours there is mildly reduced creatinine clearance but only seen in 15% of the patients if at all we see any heavy proteinuria or active urinary sediments or renal insufficiency or nephrotic syndrome in these patients it is due to superimposed non lupus related glomerular disease so uh, moving on to the light microscopy findings here here we can see mild global mesangial hypercellularity but mild uh, with thin capillary loops the capillary loops are not affected here only the mesangium is affected in immunofluorescence we can see immune deposits only in the mesangium moving on to the electron microscopy here again similar to class 1 we see mesangial electron dense deposits moving on to class 3 or focal lupus nephritis uh, it is defined by active or chronic lesions or both which may be endocapillary or extracapillary or both in location the only thing to note here is it affects less than 50% of the total glomeruli and this differentiates it from class 4 mesangial deposits may or may not be present the clinical picture here is very variable serological abnormalities like the elevated ana double stranded dna and low serum complement levels may be seen in over half of the patients active uh, urinary sediments may be seen in half of the patients proteinuria may be present in around 25 to 50% and a subset of them may show nephrotic syndrome hypertension uh, is also seen in uh, around 30% of the patients moving on to light microscopic findings here here what is characteristic is uh, al along with the mesangial deposits we see there is involvement of the capillary wall so here we see segmental endocapillary hypercellularity which causes obliteration of the capillary lumina and along with that we see some infiltrating leukocytes some uh, fibrinoid eosinophilic necrosis is seen here and mild mesangial hypercellularity may be noted in the adjacent lobules uh, in the lower image here we see this is a pas slide uh, and we see there is segmental endocapillary proliferation and there is some necrosis also there is focal rupture of the basement membrane and that leads to the formation of these uh, cellular crescents in if we notice here uh, the, this is a staining for igg and there are heavy igg deposits in the glomerular capillary walls and the lumina along with the mesangial uh, deposits here the image on the bottom right this is a characteristic picture of the wire loop deposit or a subendothelial deposit it conforms to the shape of the glomerular basement membrane and that's why we get a outer comma shaped deposit moving on to lupus nephritis class 4 otherwise known as diffuse lupus nephritis the only difference with class 3 is that the same type of lesions are found but here there is at least 50% or more involvement of the total glomeruli sample characteristic subendothelial immune deposits are seen and usually there are mesangial deposits also clinically uh, this is the most it has the most severe renal presentation active serological markers are noted here the patient may present with severe nephrotic range uh, proteinuria and active urinary sediments hypertension is common and renal insufficiency is seen in a uh, half the half of the patients and this is uh, uh, detected using the calculated gfr values moving on to the light microscopic finding we see there is global narrowing of the glomerular capillaries by mesangial and endocapillary proliferation so the capillary lumina are obliterated along with that we see wire loop deposits and we see the uh, fibrin or the hyaline thrombi in the lumina image on the bottom here shows uh, global endocapillary proliferation again with a lot of infiltrating neutrophils uh, the immunofluorescence image on the right here it shows uh, intense and diffuse staining in the glomerular mesangium and peripheral capillary loops which is consistent with the subendothelial distribution of the immune deposits the electron microscopic picture here is important because uh, apart from just the mesangial deposits we are going to see the circumferential 
sub endothelial electron dense deposits which are incorporated into the glomerular capillary wall and there is a sub endothelial neomembrane formation which forms between the sub uh, the endothelial cells and the glomer and the deposits um also there is marked mesangial expansion by mesothelial pro mesangial proliferation and uh, there are numerous uh, electron dense deposits noted in the mesangium moving on to class 5 um it is defined by global or segmental continuous sub endothelial new deposits or their morphologic sequelae this is important because unlike the mesangial or the sub endothelial deposits we have seen before this is characterized by sub epithelial deposits mesangial alterations may or may not be present here uh, these patients present with nephrotic syndrome and proteinuria hematuria and hypocomplementemia may be seen in half of the patients renal insufficiency and active urinary sediments are findings which are Uh, not seen in pure membranous forms they are more commonly seen when it is a co combined class 5 with a class 4 or class 3 lesion um, and these patients lack uh, mostly lack extra renal manifestations because of which the onset of renal disease may precede the diagnosis of sle also there is a risk of renal vein thrombosis and pulmonary emboli formation in these patients it is important to note that in the study of membranous nephropathy or membranous lupus nephritis initially the most common uh, antigens which were identified as causative or target antigens were pla2r phospholipase a2 receptor and thrombospondin 1 these accounted for around 70% and 20% of the primary lupus nephritis cases now we have a new causative uh, antigen which is exostrosin 1 and exostrosin 2 which have been detected by immunostaining and mass spectrometry so it's not primary lupus nephritis primary membranous nephropathy okay Ah, yes, sorry, ma'am. Primary membranous nephropathy. One and thrombospondin, oh. or positive in primary membranous nephropathy, not lupus nephritis. Lupus nephritis uh, causing membranous is always a secondary lesion where we have uh, they have identified exostosin one and two or the antigens. Okay, antigens. Okay, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Um, so moving on to the light microscopy findings, uh, there is a mixed diffuse proliferative and membranous. picture here and here we can see there is a complex thickening of the glomerular uh, capillary walls by the double contours if we can see a lot of areas here show double contouring enclosing the sub endothelial and the well developed sub epithelial spikes and the sub epithelial deposits or spikes are highlighted very well here on the jones smithenamine silver staining we can see these characteristic uh, sub epithelial spikes on the outer wall moving on to the immunofluorescence image on the left here shows the delicate sub epithelial immune deposits and there are no mesangial deposits here this is a pure membranous form of lupus nephritis class 5 image on the right is uh, there is a mixture of heavy mesangial deposits along with the more delicate granular sub epithelial deposits electron microscopy picture here shows numerous sub epithelial electron dense deposits here which are surrounded by spikes of glomerular basement membrane as we can see here along with that we can also see a lot of abundant mesangial electron dense deposits and if these uh, sub endothelial deposits are present in this condition and if they are sizable or if they are visible by light microscopy then an additional diagnosis of a combined like cl class 5 along with class 4 or class 3 is warranted so this is a summary of the class 1 to class 5 lesions we notice that class 1 and 2 both are characterized predominantly by mesangial deposits in class 1 they are only detected by immunofluorescence or electron microscopy not seen in light microscopy in class 2 they can be identified by light microscopy as well class 3 and 4 are very much similar uh, both have peripheral capillary wall deposits only difference is in the quantification class 3 involves less than 50% of the total glomeruli sampled and class Four involves fifty percent or more of the glomeruli, and they can be detected in both light microscopy and immunofluorescence as well as electron microscopy. The characteristic feature of class five lupus nephritis is the presence of sub epithelial deposits, which are identified by electron microscopy as well as immunofluorescence. So, moving on to the last or the class six advanced sclerosing lupus nephritis. This is characterized by extensive uh, glomerular scarring along with 90% or more global sclerosis, and there is no residual activity. 
in clinical features we notice the patient presents with renal insufficiency and hypertension this is also known as burnt out lupus because the serology is inactive here and uh, which would have previously been a case of class 3 or class 4 which has progressed to class 6 uh, these patients may have microhematuria or low grade uh, proteinuria more commonly there is a history of either a single episode of severe proliferative nephritis like a crescentric lupus nephritis or there could be a history of repeated flares of proliferative nephritis which did not respond to therapy so um, the light microscopy here picture we see uh, there are a lot of uh, global more than 90% of the glomeruli are sclerotic and they are mostly global very rarely there is segmental involvement most of them are global also uh, if or em shows may show small granular immune deposits and this picture will mimic the focal segmental glomerulosclerosis because of the sclerotic lesions so these are the six classes we saw now this is the old uh, isn rps classification in which under class 3 and class 4 they were sub classified as active lesions chronic lesions and a combination of both now we do not use this we have replaced it with the activity and chronicity index which we use for all classes so this is better because this helps in semi quantitative assessment of the pathologic features of active active and chronic injury and this will provide information for monitoring the treatment response as well as disease progression so here we check uh, features of activity like um, endocapillary hypercellularity neutrophils and cariorexis fibrinoid necrosis hyaline deposits cellular or fibro cellular crescents and interstitial inflammation of which more importance is given to fibrinoid necrosis and the crescents they are multiplied by 2 and here we give a total score out of 24 for chronicity lesions we consider total uh, glomerulosclerosis fibrous crescents tubular atrophy and interstitial fibrosis and this is graded out of 12 moving on to the uh, common electron microscopy findings we see in lupus nephritis here the image on the left we can see the, the capillary Wait lumen here is of uh, the capillary lumen here is obliterated by a massive uh, electron dense deposit this is nothing but the fibrin or the hyaline thrombus <laughs> which we see image on the right here we see uh, the along with the deposits we see electron dense structures which are known as tubulo reticular inclusions tubulo reticular inclusions are nothing but they are um, interanastomosing tubular structures which are seen in the dilated cisternae of endoplasmic reticulum they are more commonly seen in the endothelial cells these are intracellular inclusions which are seen in lupus nephritis so moving on the next thing we will see here is the deposits in lupus nephritis appear uniformly granular but they may show an organized substructure so what is the substructure is that ultra structural level we can see that the deposits are either made up of these uh, fibrillar arrays or we can see a fingerprint array like we see here next we move on to the etiopathogenesis which is uh, poorly understood we have to consider three factors one is genetic hormonal and environmental factors and immunological factors uh genetic factors are considered because the incidence of this disease is high in family members and identical twins some uh, sing, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms have been identified uh, a heritable deficiency of complement components like c2 and c4 has been documented and the affected genes uh, involved are noted in uh, those concerning innate and adaptive immunity immune complex clearance and epigenetics in hormonal and environmental factors we note that uh, there is an increased incidence of lupus nephritis in women of child bearing age so we have to consider the role of sex hormones and pregnancy um also there is uh, the pregnancy exposure to drugs and uv light act as triggers for uh, repeated flares or recurrences of sle in immunological factors this disease has been characterized by a loss of self tolerance which is why there is auto antibody production against a variety of nuclear antigens uh, t cell and b cell functions are dysregulated there is a polyclonal b cell activation also the t tl toll like receptor signaling in b cells has been affected so numerous theories have been uh, given one is that due to apoptosis there is increased exposure to endogenous dna now the nuclear auto antigens in our body they mimic viral particles and they activate interferon and they elicit antiviral uh, immune response so basically conditions which increase exposure to the endogenous dna by apoptosis like pregnancy hormonal cycles sunburn etc they act as trigger factors for 
lupus in the susceptible individuals also these um, auto antibodies are localized within the glomerular immune deposits there are two mechanisms for that one is auto antibodies which are formed uh, they bind with the planted auto antigens in the glomeruli and next is the they may have show cross reactivity with the normal glomerular constituents like heparin sulfate proteoglycans etc and that will lead to in situ immune complex formation next we have to consider the localization of immune deposits within the glomeruli some immune deposits uh, favor like there are more mesangial deposits when the immune complexes are small amounts or intermediate in size whereas uh, if the immune complexes are uh, small amount but if they are cationic immune complexes they will favor sub epithelial deposition and a large quantity of immune complex will deposit in the sub endothelial region so this is influenced by the class or subclass of immunoglobulins the electric charge and the antigen specificity then uh, due to the binding of these auto antibodies they may exert some direct cellular uh, effects like enhanced proliferation or apoptosis and that may lead to glomerular pathology another way is they activate the complement system and that leads to the activation of inflammatory mediators there is dysregulation of inflammatory cytokines chemokines and the genes involved in apoptosis and cell cycle and that leads to glomerular cell proliferation and progresses sclerosis so to finish up with the prognosis uh, it depends on the age sex and race a poor outcome has been noted in african americans in males and in children people with lower socio economic status those with uh, elevated creatinine levels and low hematocrit levels and those who have repeated or uh, recurrence of sle also it depends on the pathological severity which is determined by the class of lupus nephritis the activity and chronicity index and also transition between the different classes as such when there is a diagnosis of combined membranous and proliferative lupus nephritis like class 5 plus 3 or like in our place where we have given a diagnosis of class 5 plus 4 it calls for a poor prognosis these are my references thank you so so you are coming sir hi are you audible yes sir am i audible now oh, yeah. yes sir yes sir am i Okay. Yes. No, I didn't know because uh, I joined very late in the sense because I was uh, struggling to get into it. Anyway, the presentation mm -hmm. is good. Uh, I must say the presentation is good, but I didn't know the case. What What was the case? So it's uh, Ramlakshmi Ma'am's case, sir. Uh, Nisha, mm -hmm. if the, Nisha the presented, but I could not uh, get into that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, was it a class four five? Uh, yes, sir. Combined lupus. Now, what class is the outcome? Um, I want to ask Nisha what is the outcome of the patient. Yeah, Nisha, can you yes, complete? Uh, yes, ma'am. I'll just show it. Hmm. You have any idea about what happened to this patient, Nisha? Ah, uh, yes, ma'am. So what happened was, um, he had class four or five. I believe he would have required cyclophosphamide and uh, prednisolone. But he is an unmarried mm -hmm. man, so after discussing fertility issues and all, we started off with MMF and steroid. Along mm -hmm. with uh, tell me certain and HCQ, uh, initially mm -hmm. there was some improvement of his creatinine and came down to one point two. But after a week, slowly his creatinine started rising. We eliminated pre-renal causes and we thought the disease was aggressive, so we changed him over to IV cyclophosphamide. So he has okay. currently got his first uh, monthly injection. He'll be coming another week for his second month injection. After that, his RFT has actually stabilized at 1.3. He still has a lot of uh, significant edema, but the arthralgia and all has completely subsided, and his systemic symptoms are much better. Okay. Okay. Ram Lakshmi, Ram Lakshmi, what, 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 what is it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, what, what is your comment? comment? Uh, yeah, good presentation. Thank you, uh, PGs. Uh, regarding this case, actually, um, initially itself, because of the activity, uh, severe activity and bone marrow suppression, he qualified for cyclophosphamide. As Nisha told, the patient was not willing, so he went into MMR. I feel he was non-compliant on MMR. This is one of the okay. indications why. No, he, you, uh, why didn't you try Rituximab? 
No, sir. Actually, by guidelines, uh, we have to first try MMF for cyclophosphamide. Only then rituximab comes in, sir. Still, we don't have as per guidelines, sir. Okay. So, um, and uh, I think the more than that, I think he was not compliant with MMF. No, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this is uh, by the way comment. Uh, presently, what I see is several of the patients who have lupus. I've been given rituximab, and they come come to me. Yeah, when they go for uh, you know window shopping, no, they come to different nephrologists. I see lots and lots of rituximab use in lupus four. Yes, sir. <laughs> Actually, the um, the sir, clinical information I get from everybody, I use a lot of rituximab also, sir. But nobody knows the long term data, and yeah, our yeah, really. guideline is very clear, sir, about MMF and cyclophosphamide. It's either yeah. one MMF, or MMF and cyclophosphamide is well known. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. The recent, but, uh, but as far as uh, I am concerned, in this young fellow, nothing is going to happen if you are careful about the dose of cyclophosphamide. No? Yes, sir. Nothing will happen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. So in okay. the, the recent conferences of a uh, pathology conference, Dr. Anthony Chang, who is doing extensive study on the lupus nephritis. Mm. He was mentioning about this uh, rituximab therapy, sir. Uh, extensive mm. search was done on uh, B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes that is present in the interstitium. So they are making some um, uh, studies. Uh, so based on that, I don't know, uh, maybe it will come in future <laughs> to look for all this quantification using the uh, IHC of uh, CD20. Okay. Okay. So which may help, they may tailor it later, I don't know. So this is what he mentioned in this talk recently, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Long term is good. The long term is not sure. Same thing. There's one more about Benupinab. That is also a very promising drug in lupus nephritis right now, latest. Okay. So they also published recently that they have very good resp uh, response for lupus nephritis. Okay, ma'am. Okay. But see, this is the very highest risk patient. Severe activity, male lupus. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Failure. That is the most uh, uh, bad prognosis. The initial presentation of creatinine is the worst prognosis for anybody usually. So yes, that's why I thought let him let me hit him with the cyclophosphate and then we will decide. Yes. yes. So for okay. so okay. uh, PGs, I just, I just like to emphasize in the recent end, they have made these changes. Whatever uh, Josephine has told you, so this may be asked very frequently in your exams also. Very important factor is, as she rightly pointed out, only the hyaline thrombi alone can be present in a diffuse pattern. So not necessarily you should see endocapillary hypercellularity, but provided there is a diffuse hyaline thrombi, that is subendothelial deposit alone, looking like a wire loop, we have to quantify that as class 4. We need not see an endocapillary hypercellularity as such. So this is one point emphasized uh, repeatedly in this uh, NIH classification. Also, we should also count the uh, globally sclerosed glomeruli uh, into our percentage of uh, glomerulus. That is again very important. We should not leave the globally sclerosed glomeruli, only the active glomeruli we should take for quantification. That is wrong. We should include all the glomerular uh, that is present in the biopsy. Then we have to categorize them and give accordingly. Uh, we have to call it according to the uh, involvement of the glomerulus. Do not, not leave, leave out, out the glomerulus. These two points. Two point. I just want to add one more point. Josephine, it's a very good presentation. You stress more on interferon because a lot of th targeted therapies, they are focusing on interferon level. The activity depends on the interferon level. So that's another focus for uh, therapy. Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Rajan. Rajan. I think your emphasis is on therapy. Very, very happy. happy. <laughs> we are looking, sir. We are looking into okay. the interferon. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. And Thank you. Uh, Thank this you. TRI have been uh, seen in. Uh, Corona positive patients also. So please oh. remember that. So, uh, SLE, uh, HIV was there, but now some papers have come, TRI are seen in uh, Corona positive kidney bias. Yes. Thank you. Corona looks uh, sarvan <laughs> yummy. Yummy. Every, every, every. <laughs> Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you, sir. Close the session, sir. Jack Ma, sir. Thank you, Nisha. Very good presentation.